the final program in our series closing the care gap and of course uh, as part of cancer awareness month we've been discussing quite a bit about that and sharing with you information that you can use of course to uh, help protect yourself all right this evening we have two very special guests with us of course dr. Nixon is here uh, she's no guest she works with me <laughs> she doesn't like when I say that but she does <laughs> of course uh, we have have Dr. William Aiken. He's no stranger. He has been on the program before. And uh, Dr. Aiken, we welcome you back. And of course, Dr. Tonya Frame. She's the Assistant Professor of Global Health at St. George's University. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go over to Dr. Nixon, and she's going to do the official welcome of our guest this evening. Dr. Nixon. So good evening, Grenada. And again, I want to remind you guys that Godfrey does not pay me. <laughs> but it's my pleasure being here because I think we need to do this together as a community, as a not just a local Grenadian community, but as a Caribbean community. And for all our friends and um, local and otherwise who are in the diaspora. So we started off this four weeks ago speaking about cancer in Grenada, cancer in the world, but most things we've been focusing on. ensuring that people have opportunities for screening. We spoke to CEDO, St. Andrew's Development Organization, as a community-based organization who offers um, guidance and who leads us, the other organizations from outside, into the nooks and crannies of Grenada to provide service, and who also offer support to women in their communities. And we also spoke to the women from Pink Ribbon who said what they did particularly with with, with women with breast cancer, how they offered support, but also how they offer support generally to people across Grenada who have cancer. Last week was took it a little broader. How do we provide facilities for care? Grenada Planned Parenthood um, Association has been out of out of commission for a couple of years, two, almost three years, and has recently launched with a lot of fervor, a lot of enthusiasm to ensure that women's health um, are put back on the front burner, to ensure that women have access to those things that affect women and their entire health. 
and Mrs. Marva Joseph was, was with us last week and shared a lot of information, um, as well as Dr. Carol McIntosh, who has led something that was kind of novel in the private sector, well, in the public sector, although GPPA has been offering um, so like a cancer screening, breast examination, they also offer what we call visual inspection using acetic acid for screening for, breast, um, for cancer of the cervix, which is the second most common kind of cancer. Um, now, the government has started training. They actually have trained nurses and three centers in Grenada. So kind of looked at globally how all of us have a part. But um, we kind of exist in isolation. And so tonight we have speakers, Dr. Tonya Frame that everybody knows and about, <laughs> and Dr. William Aiken, who everybody knows, and we want to welcome him back home because this is becoming his second home. I've heard people in the community say, oh, what's that, what's that jam down name again? Man, he was good. So people have listened to you, and they go back to listen to Dr. Aiken when he spoke last year on, on issues of men's cancer. The truth is, in order to close the gap in cancer, in cancer care, whether it's education, screening, managed treatment, um, getting advanced treatment, um, recuperation, reincorporation to society, offering um, end of life care, we have to come together. It has to be a collective effort. We have to use evidence-based information in order to make sure that we go the, the best way possible, the less expensive and most efficient way. And so tonight we have two people who have had their hands deep into not only just teaching academia, but in the case of Dr. Aiken, who is a surgeon, who is actually the head of the Department of Surgery at the University of the West Indies. Um, no, you're not? What are you, urology? <laughs> Well, you're going to fix that, Dr. Aiken. Um, we have Dr. Aiken, who has a lot of experience as a urologist, and whom I know in the last few weeks have been working assiduously with the with other partners in Jamaica as we try to revive the whole issue of cancer and cancer care for the population in Jamaica. I also know that you've been involved in a lot of research, and you're very... Um, you're very enthusiastic about research in our communities. So I'm sure you have something to share with us. And so we welcome you back tonight to Grenada and hope to see a whole lot more. I promise you I have a lot of more work for you. And Dr. Tony Frame, um, little but Talawa, big, little but big in her own way, who is an assistant professor of global health at St. George's University but also now is the chairperson of Grenada Planned Parenthood Association. And I know that she's enthusiastic, and I know that they have great plans, and they want to see these plans going. So tonight, um, I want to welcome them. Dr. Frame also is very involved in research. And if we don't do research among our own populations, how will we ever get ahead fixing our own problems? And so I want to welcome you both tonight. And thank you for being here. Thank you very much, so, Dr. Nixon. So, thank you, Dr. Nixon. Thank you for having me back here. It's a pleasure. Back. And, th and thanks your family again for always lending you, lending you to us, okay? Um, Dr. Freeman, I'm going to start with you because I, I want us to do it um, the backwards way, from the big one, the, from the big space, and back down to the small space. Um, give us a little a little overview of the global challenges with women's cancers and then and then come back and try can you put it into perspective as to how we're similar not just in the caribbean but in grenada to what else is happening in the world today as far as the research goes for having me here tonight thank you godfrey and Dr. Nixon and your viewing and listening public. Um, so as far as, as cancers are concerned, this is a, a, an important public health challenge, um, not just for the Caribbean, not just for Grenada, but, but globally, right? And um, 
as we're aware, in Grenada, cancer is our leading, comprising our leading cause of, of death, right? And, um, and the sickness, it's what makes us sick. It's a little different globally. Um, usually prior to COVID, it was um, cardiovascular diseases and so on. But COVID has sort of just put a wrench in everything. And in a lot of places, COVID is now the number one cause of death, right? Um, but cancer still um, is a major priority. And the projections are that as, as far as looking into the future, that the situation is only going to get worse. Um, it is projected that by 2040, the incidence of cancer is going to increase by about 65%, right? And in the Caribbean, that increase, the Caribbean is actually the region of the world, Latin America and the Caribbean, to be more specific, is the region of the world um, where the second highest um, increases in cancer is expected to occur. Right? Um, and while we're talking about women, cancers in men is actually um, expected to increase at a higher rate, right? So, so you're going to have more men with cancers than women, right? Um, so when we're having, when we have these conversations, you know, because women, Women go to the, see the doctor, right? We're, we're health seekers, we're health seekers. There's no um, sort of social restrictions. If anything, men think we, see the, we go to the doctor too often, right? And, and men are, are, are in the reverse. Most men don't like to go and see the doctor. So the challenge here is that, of course, you're seeing a lot of women, a lot of cases among women, but when you, because the men are going later in a lot of instances, right? They're going when, we say here, when water more than flour, right? They just can't take it again. They can't bear the pain. Whatever it is, they, they can't go to work. They can't function normally, right? That is when they want to go and seek help. So a lot of times, they're in a much worse situation than we are. Right? So comparing Grenada, again, globally, the challenge for Grenada as far as cancer, so yes, we have a reproductive cancer, or we have um, breast and cervical cancer leading the pack, as Dr. Nixon would have discussed in previous programs, right? But prostate cancer among men is highest in Grenada. Right, that is the form of cancer. When you look at the graphs and the charts, I haven't seen recent ones for Grenada, but I don't expect that the trend um, would have changed much. Right, is that the the, the um, numbers for breast cancer and cervical cancer are all the way down to the bottom, and and ones for prostate cancer are you know as tall as a coconut tree. Right? Um, so prostate cancer among men is a very serious issue um, that we must grapple with in the Caribbean and in, and in Grenada in particular, right? Um, so I think as we go forward, um, you know, we, and we have this discussion about cancers and we try to make some distinctions between the, the genders or between the sexes, we have to keep a, a clear focus on, on all of our population um, because it is a problem that really affects all of us, right? And many of us know someone who has cancer. Um, now I think more people are talking about it. I remember my mother said, you know, in her days they used to call it the beast, right? It didn't have a name. When you went to see the doctor, they, they would say, you know, that person has the beast. And that, that's what they called it. But now we're hearing cancer, cancer. And that's a step in the right direction. Okay. Do Dr. Nixon, you any 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 question for Dr. Aiken? Yeah, hold on. So Dr. Frame, I wanna I wanna help you out on that. Um, and while we're focusing on women, we can't leave a minute in order to keep balance. The truth is, I was actually told a few days ago that Last year alone, we had 43 men diagnosed with prostate cancer. And that is in a year when people are not seeking health, health um, care. So try to imagine. 
it must have been the people who already way towards the end of have, uh, who have challenges. So that is not, I'm going to look to see to make sure that I'm fine. That is not, you know, I was listening to the doctors, let me go check my prostate. That was a case of um, already can't pass urine or I see a little bit of my urine. There are some symptoms. But thank you, Dr. Fred. Dr. Dr. Aiken, thanks again, as we say, for being here. I guess Jamaica is actually probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest places in the Caribbean where research is done. And um, I've seen recently in the last few weeks that you have actually really pumped up the volume on the whole issue of bringing to light the whole the problem of cancer in Jamaica. Can you tell us what has been happening with you and what you how you what are, what are you doing in Jamaica to ensure that awareness and access people are getting to care in order to close some of those gaps, the gaps of the death between illness and death, you know, to close the, the, the expenditure on severe illness, etc. What have you been doing? What is happening in Jamaica? Thank you. Thank you for asking me uh, this question. And it's a pleasure to be here to speak to you and your listeners. So Jamaica, unlike Grenada, um, cardiovascular disease is our number one cause of death. Jamaica, like most low and middle income countries, we operate in a very tight fiscal space. And, and you know, the government has to grapple with, with funding. There are so many competing causes for the limited funding that's available. Only 21% of our population has health insurance. Only 21%. Our population is aging. I think most Caribbean territories, our population is aging. It's, it's predicted that um, for over 65 are going to double um, from 8% to 16% by 2030. Our population is aging now, and of course, cancer is predominantly a disease of aging person. Mm -hmm. So as Dr. Frame said, we are going to be definitely seeing an increased incidence and prevalence of cancer. And coupled with that, we have a, a very low level of awareness where cancers are concerned, despite the fact that over the years we have had several you know, public health initiatives to increase awareness of, of cancer. Part of the problem is I think that we have gone about it the wrong way in that we have these symposia and we invite people to come. But typically the people who come are those who are already aware, those who are maintaining good health. And even when we invite people to come into screen, we're seeing a bias, a bias sample of persons, in that the persons who come are not representative of the general people in the population. So we, I don't think we have made tremendous inroads in terms of cancer. Our Ministry of Health has um, a national policy regarding non-communicable diseases. Recently, we had a number of initiatives to have screening guidelines, new screening guidelines for different cancers, but these have not yet been implemented, I think largely because COVID came along and, uh, and sort of derailed those initiatives. But I know the Ministry of Health has a plan to have uh, a sort of primary health care push um, towards um, screening of cancers in our population. Our major cancers are, are prostate cancer in men, breast cancer and cervical cancer in women, and colon cancer in both sexes. Those four cancers account for the majority of cancers in our, in our adults. And so we have a number of challenges. Some of them are cultural. Um, men wear it as a badge of honor that they, you know, that they have never seen a doctor. As Dr. Frame and yourself pointed out, men do not have um, possess the sort of preventative 
um, health seeking behavior that women do. They typically present when they have a problem. And most of these cancers are asymptomatic or they don't produce symptoms in their early stages. And so if, if people present when they are having symptoms, it usually means that the cancers are either locally advanced or they have metastasized or spread. And so one of the challenges we have in Jamaica is trying to increase the level of public awareness about the importance of screening. Um, as I said, we have gone about it the wrong way. I think what we need to do is go into the communities where the men and the women are, um, where you will find them at their recreational activities and use those captive moments to increase awareness um, about these cancers. For example, in the US, they use barbershops. You know, men frequent barbershops, men frequent um, sporting events, men frequent the bar. And so these are places where um, it may prove a, 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 a useful or useful opportunity to capture the men's um, attention and increase their level of awareness of, of, of prostate cancer and other cancer. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there for the moment. Right. Um, let me let me come in here, uh, Dr. Nixon, and ask because. Um, we're hearing that, and from Dr. Frame, that um, we can see a significant increase um, in cancer. And clearly, um, aside from people not taking enough personal responsibility, um, there are some challenges with, with the health system, um, and, and in our case, in Grenada. Uh, Dr. Frame, can you, can you um, highlight maybe what some of these challenges and how we can actually address them so we can sort of mitigate against the um, you know incidence of cancer or the, the, that, that um, quick increase in cancer so I think just about every time I, I speak I go to um, one of my favorite frameworks or models right um, to sort of address these kinds of issues, right? Um, and, and I use it all the time with my students. It's called the socio-ecological model, right? And um, I think it's an extremely useful model because when you speak with organizations, international organizations, communities, whatever, um, it makes sense, right? We talk about involving everyone, a multi-sectoral approach. We talk about a whole of government, a whole of community approach, getting everyone on board, right? And, and you started off by saying, you know, about taking personal responsibility. But in my world, this personal responsibility issue is a very complex issue. Right? It's more than just the phrase, what does it really mean to take personal responsibility? Right? Because when you think about the individual, right, there are a number of different factors that, is, that, that either helps that individual or holds back this individual from taking personal responsibility. Right? The individual may leave, live in a place where that it just it's just not they just can't take personal responsibility, even if they want to, right? So the, the, the reason that we have governments, right, and, and I don't think this is just my opinion, um, I think this is scholarly opinion and well accepted, accepted opinion, right, is to facilitate the development of the people, right? Um, and so to make those conditions available, so people can actually take personal responsibility, right? I agree, we must take personal responsibility, but people have to be provided a, a construct, a framework, the mechanisms, the tools, the skills. Ambiance. Right, the services, yes, the ambiance, right? All of the, 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 the vehicles that are needed for them to take personal responsibility, starting with the information, right? So I think these forums are excellent. 
in giving people the information as a starting point. Um, but we have to have the health services available, right? So we need to have our Ministry of Health um, performing their role as the Ministry of Health and making access to our health services, to our health facilities, ensuring that those barriers to care and to services are removed, right? So that, that you know, a man doesn't, want, doesn't have to choose between losing a day work or a woman, right? Between losing a day work and going to see the doctor. Because he says, watch, you know, I should, I, I'm really not feeling good in truth, you know. And I probably should, should listen to my wife and go and see the doctor, you know. But if I go to see the doctor, you know what? I can't go to work because I'm going to sit down there for the whole day. Right? So he's losing 60, 70 more dollars a day by going to the, making the decision to go to the doctor. Right? And early screening is really important. Right? So we want to remove those barriers. Right? We want to have that available. We want to have the information in the media and in different places at the workplaces so people have that access to that information to help them to take personal responsibility. Right? We want people to, to have the information about their diet, what they're eating. Right? They, we want them to have information and, and places. Right? So, so not just the information but the skills and the tools. So information about eating, but do we have enough places where they can get good, affordable, healthy meals that actually look good and taste good, right? You want them to get exercise, but can they go to a playing field um, after they come from work and it's lit and it's safe, right? Do we have sidewalks? that are, you know, not broken and not only in St. George's, right? Um, where people can walk. I remember I lived, I lived in Shanty Mill. I grew up in Shanty Mill. And my grandmother, when she was diagnosed with diabetes, we live on a hill, right? She was, a little, she was overweight. She needed to, to get some exercise as per the advice of the doctor. But she couldn't go on the hill every day to walk because we live on the main road and lots of traffic, right? So do we have the means to make the personal response, to take the personal responsibility? And I think those are the things going forward that we need to think about. How do we make our communities our partners, and I agree, I agree with Dr. Aiken, um, that we need to take the show to the community, take the show on the road to the communities, right? Because that's where the real work happens, right? Our communities are eager, to really get engaged, and I think we need to take the, the, the work to the communities, make them key stakeholders, give them the opportunity to make the decisions about what is important for them, right? Um, let them tell us what the strengths of their communities are, not just look at their communities as, you know, decrepit, it, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, the children misbehaving, they this and they that. Lots of strengths in those communities, right? Let's, let's take Guav, right? Guav people, don't kill me, but, right? But the point is, Guav is one of those communities that is very close-knit and has a lot of strengths. Very integrated. Yeah. Right? Very, very much so. And a lot of people may say, oh, you know, Guav people, they like a lot of confusion, they this, they that, right? But Guaf is a very close-knit and strong community. And so if we, if we get into these communities and we use the community members as resources, right? Dr. Aiken and I are not experts, you know, right? We're, we're a different kind of experts, right? But the people who are in the trenches feeling it every day, they're the real experts because they actually know what can solve those problems. And so we have to listen to them and do the things that they think will work to get them to the point where they would change and make the right decisions to access the services that are available and you know when they do become available even what we have even what we have we can do a lot with it right um but there are some things we there's room for improvement and so but i think it takes a lot of collaboration 
working with different stakeholders, and at the center of the stakeholder model must be our communities. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you very much, Dr. Dr. Frey. Dr. Nixon, just before we bring in Dr. Aiken, we must take a short break here and we're going to come back. So when we come back, we're going to, I, I would like, um, you know, to hear what Dr. Aiken has to say as it relates to um, Dr. Frey's, um, you know, uh, comments on, on this issue. So stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment. If there was ever a time to keep and stay healthy, it's now. We at Hills and Valley are here to help you take deliberate steps to maintain your health. We stayed true to maintaining the most comprehensive rates while stocking the widest range of medicines and health devices, including personal protective equipment. There are so many benefits shopping with us. You get great savings through discounts for senior citizens and reward cards for loyal customers. Ask about owning yours today. Visit us at Halifax and Grenville Street, St. George, Jubilee Street opposite the Grenville Bus Terminal and at Hillsborough Carico. Our wholesale distribution on Halifax Street also stocks the widest range of pharmaceuticals. We are with you on the hills and in the valleys. We are Hills and Valley Pharmacy. The Nawasa app brings the power of Nawasa's customer service experience to you. Instant, conversational, and smart. Easy access anywhere. Get bill balance, transaction history for up to six months, report a fault, link to websites, view payment centers, contact information, push notifications, and multi-tenant accounts, all in a secure login platform. Like a self-service concierge app, mobile.nawasa.gd, gets you the support you need much faster. Available on both Android and iOS platforms. Mobile.nawasa.gd, your customer support companion. Nawasa, committed to meeting customers' needs. level of convenience and comfort awaits you when you shop at Rise and Shine Supermarket and Hardware Supplies, Griffin Lane, Grenville. Convenient, because we are open Sunday to Sunday. We're even at your service on public holidays. Comfort, because we are easily accessible to the physically challenged. Free Wi-Fi is available while you shop, and bags come at no charge. Everyday low prices and excellent customer care. Adequate parking available. We supply everything you can possibly think of. Family and home supplies, fresh meat, vegetables, and personal care products. All brands of cooking gas at affordable prices. You can send in your order, have it pulled, or pick up express. When a loved one passes on, we all need the comfort, support, and guidance of a trusted friend. You can rely on LaCour Brothers Funeral Home. We provide a personalized professional service that exceeds all expectations. Our dedicated staff responds to your every need with the greatest detail, ensuring affordability with a variety of options. Our upgraded state-of-the-art facilities, spacious air-conditioned chapel with live internet streaming, a modern environmentally safe crematorium, the only of its kind on island. Private viewing spaces, large on-site repass center, a modern transportation fleet. Join our burial society today and make personalized arrangements for that final moment. As you prepare to enter your loved one into eternal rest, visit or call the Quar Brothers Funeral Home and select a package that brings added comfort to the entire family. The Quar Brothers Funeral Home and Burial Society, continuing a tradition of excellence. Vaccine safety is always a top priority. Like other vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines being developed have been through the same trial phases and rigorous process required for all vaccines. Global efforts on the development of the vaccines are built on existing research from previous coronaviruses like MERS and SARS-1. As COVID-19 vaccines are approved for their broad use in the population, be reassured that they will continue to be monitored to identify any adverse events. Your safety is our top priority. Vaccines bring us closer. Choose to get vaccinated.
most common causes of spreading the flu. Cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue, dispose of it straight away, and either wash your hands or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. back it's doctor and call and uh, we continue our discussion on closing the k gap um dr aiken we dr frame just spoken a number of very very important issues and um I, I would like to get your thoughts on some of the things that she mentioned because i saw you nodding um you, you were giving this uh, nods of approval um, <laughs> throughout her, her discourse uh, so i'd like to hear you on this let me just, for the record, say I agree 100% with what Dr. Frame said. You know, there is a very important government organization in Jamaica called the National Health Fund. They have done a world of good because they use monies from excise and, and duties and taxes, and they fund um, important, they significantly discount um, important cancer drugs and drugs for HIV, diabetes, and so on, and they make these drugs affordable. But one of the slogans of the National Health Fund that I've always disagreed with is that it says, and I quote, your health is your responsibility. I, I disagree vehemently with that statement because there are so many, as Dr. Prim very eloquently said, there are so many um, important um, factors beyond the individual that affect your health. And I'll give you examples. Our, our population is becoming increasingly obese. Right. Um, each time we do a national survey, you find that obesity is increasing. Obesity is linked to 11 cancers. Right. The scientific evidence shows that obesity is linked to 11 cancers. You cannot just simply say to people that they must um, exercise and eat right. You have to provide the recreational facilities for them to exercise. You have to create an environment in which they can feel that they can safely go on the road and exercise. You have to create an environment where people can gain access, easy access, to have their five servings of fruits and vegetables daily. When a, when a mother with limited resources, financial resources, has to decide if she's going to spend a ton load of money on fruits and vegetables, which by the way, cost a lot more than your fast food, and which by the way, if she gives her a little child, they're not going to eat it anyway, they prefer the cheap tricks and so on, she's going to default to buying what is, what is speeding and what is accessible to her. So we can't talk about your health is your responsible responsibility. There, there are what we call structural determinants of health that are that go well beyond the the individual. I'll give you another example. In Jamaica, recently we had a, a controversy because the the National Heart Foundation, along with other entities, wanted to put this what is called this front of label packaging so that when people go to the supermarket these front of label packages packaging um, would be in bold black labels that people would be able to see exactly what the content of the food they're buying is and the ministry of health recommended it other stakeholders re recommended it but guess what our, our cabinet didn't pass it because big business, big business lobbies came on board and 
they knew that they would lose a lot of revenues when people start reading these front of labor packages, um, labels. And because of that, it, has, it wasn't us. And so a simple thing like that, where people have access to um, nutritional information so that they can make healthy choices, something like that has, was blocked by, by corporate entities because they recognized they would be losing money if people were made more aware of the health content. So that's an example of things that go beyond the individual, you know? And, and I, I could go on and on. They, 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 I, I alluded to the fact earlier that only 21% of our population has access to health insurance. You know, a lot of cancer drugs are very costly, <laughs> exceedingly costly. And without access to insurance and so on, only a small percentage of persons can access these drugs readily. As I said, the National Health Fund has helped tremendously because it is significantly subsidized because of the majority of drugs, but there are still a lot more drugs that Jamaicans don't have access to that have been proven to increase survival in persons um, diagnosed with cancer. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aiken. Dr. Nixon, anything you want to come in with? Um... So, Dr. Aiken, thank you very much. It actually made me a little nostalgic because the, the work that the, the National Health Fund has done is in about 20 years has been tremendous. But you're also right. So one of the things I wanted to, in, in segueing from what Dr. Frame said to something you had said earlier, is the whole issue of having a, a plan. Because you can do whatever you want if you don't plan to do it properly based on the, the population's ability to understand what it is, to figure out what they can do, to put their input and to be able to work. You know, inheritable or favorite social ecological model of care. It has to start from the very core. Yeah, they can say what what NHF says. Um, you, your head is is your, your, is your responsibility, and the rest of the and the rest of the world. Okay, you just one person. You can't have health care if you don't have health insurance or at least some access to care, living in a social environment, like in the UK or like in Canada where they have social health plans and you, you have access, right? You can't have health care that is efficient if 2%, what percentage of our population, 10% have health insurance, maybe, or maybe less, certainly less than Jamaica, I can tell you that much, right? And what is it? We still are combating, we still are struggling to figure out what we're gonna do about our national health insurance. And is it going to be like the old time LOJ? Um, you remember that managed care plan that fell badly by the roadside? Or is it gonna be something like what you have with the, with the National Health Service where you can go and care, whatever level of care is, is, is there? It's gonna be like Japan, it's gonna be like Sweden, it's gonna be like the UK, it's gonna be like America. Who is it gonna be like? We still have to determine that. The bottom line, however, is that we're gonna have to develop a plan that takes into consideration the need of the 100,000 of us. We just have study population, right? That is going to, and Grenadians are very opinionated, okay? People will tell you, no, sir, no, ah, we're not doing that. That can work for us. People in La Mode don't eat whatever. We eat whatever. So you're gonna have to create a plan that can take into, into, into consideration everybody. So you've had a plan because you talked about guidelines. How have you be, how has that worked for you in trying to get your system, your 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 cancer interventions, your cancer care gap closure going? How has that worked for you? Okay, so the Ministry of Health has um, a comprehensive um, non-communicable diseases. Um, plan, which cancer is part of that. So the truth is that um, prior to COVID, you could see where the Ministry of Health 
has taken the steps to um, involve the various stakeholders um, to get feedback on how best to implement this plan. For example, um, they had reached out to various um, medical groups about a national health insurance. There, um, I know the ministry um, wanted to, and in fact, they have in, in some ways started um, a national cancer registry. Not sure how effective it is. They met with various stakeholders and came up with um, new screening guidelines for a number of cancers that are very um, involved and comprehensive and scientific process was involved in coming up with these. But none of these things have really been put in motion. And I know also that the, the focus is on primary health care. So, so like most Caribbean territories that, they, that we have a mountainous um, geography and there are barriers to accessing health care because of our geography, the, the, the focus would have been on, on the primary health care centers that are close to the various communities and you would have a a, 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 a referral system right up through the system from primary to secondary to tertiary care. So there is a plan, but the, the communication of that plan to the wider public, I think, was derailed by COVID, and the implementation of that plan um, was also the real bad COVID because, to be honest, the, the, the resources of the Ministry of Health has been diverted primarily to fight the COVID, and it has had a major negative impact on a, a number of aspects of healthcare, um, not least of which is cancer care. Cancer care has gotten a major blow um, from the diversion of, of resources. Um, to managing COVID in Jamaica. And I suspect that is um, throughout the Caribbean as well. Okay. Um, I, Dr. Frame, I have a question I would like to ask. Um, as it relates to public health, what, what role does public health play in cancer prevention? Such an excellent question, Godfrey. Very, very important. Um... Public health, for those who may not be aware, deals with prevention, right? So we, we like to make the distinction between public health and, and medicine, right? So as public health practitioners, our focus is on the prevention of diseases, the prevention of negative health outcomes and consequences, right? We are not in the business of providing treatment prescribing medication and all of those things. So I always say that if as public health practitioners we are doing a good job, right, we should see um, much fewer cases of all of these diseases that are plaguing our communities and our countries and regions and so on, right? But there is something about our practice of public health um, where we're failing, we're failing miserably, right? And, and I really want to think it's because of the way that we're not engaging um, our communities, that it's, it's about the ways, um, you know, how, how we don't have the, the financial resources in a lot of cases, right? Um, we don't set our own agenda, those kinds of things, right? So oftentimes we're, we, we, we can't actually work on the things that really matter to us in the ways that it matters to us, right? Um, so I think we're failing for some of these reasons. Um, but public health is really about prevention and trying to get give people the information as the first step, right? So there's something called um, the, the six building blocks of health systems. And information is one of those building blocks, right? You must have information. Someone must be aware that there is a problem, that a problem could occur if these 
things don't happen. If I don't get my, my five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, if I don't get 30 you know, minutes of, of exercise a day, um, even if it's just walking, right? Um, and, and, and whatever those, those particular steps that we are to take, they must have the, they must have first have the information, right? There's leadership and governance. Public health leadership is important, right? So do we, can we provide the kind of leadership that our people need in giving them that information and that um, making the services available? Dr. Nixon talked about, um, about national health insurance, right? Are we making, again, the means of financing so people can afford care? Public health has a role in all of those, right? Um, health promotion, right? So it's not just about giving people information, but giving people the skills, showing people how to prepare healthy meals. And I know you've had um, Miss Lydia Brown from the Food and Nutrition Council on your program before. Right? So teaching people how to actually prepare healthy meals and to how not to cook the life out of the, veg out of the vegetables so that when you, when you have them on your fork, you know, they're kind of droopy, the color is dull, it's not that nice rich color that, you know, when you put them in the pot when you, from when you started, right? Um, how not to put so much salt in our foods and all of those things, right? Um, the service delivery and the human resources, do we have enough? Right? Are we providing the types of services that people need to keep them healthy? Right? Dr. Aiken talked about primary health care. Are we getting most of our services from the hospital? Right? Is that our first stop? Or can we run to the, you know, 15 minutes at our nearest health center or medical station and get the care that we need there? Right? Public health is, has a role in that as well, right? Um, the medicines and technologies. Also, you know, the whole design of our health system. Public health is really everywhere in, in the health system. But our focus is on keeping people healthy, right? We want people to go to see a doctor, go to, see, go to, go to a health facility to stay healthy, not because they're sick and they need to get better, right? Go to get a checkup, make sure you're on the right track. Go to, you know, just to find out, check in with your doctor that, you know, just, just check my vitals. What can I do to improve the way that I'm feeling, the way that I'm, li I'm living to manage my stress, all of these things, right? And all of this is much easier said than done, right? Which is why we need the partnership and we need the support and we need to get everyone on board um, because... We, I think, you know, you, you, you know, our, our grandparents used to say, prevent, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. That's public health. That's exactly public health, right? Because it's expensive. Um, you know, treatment is expensive. Prevention is so much cheaper, so so much more cost effective, and so much more beneficial for us. But but but, um, doc, Dr. Frame, you know, I, I'm listening to you, and, and a million thoughts keep going through my mind. And earlier, um, you you spoke about. Uh, you know, it's difficult for us to take personal responsibility. Um, personal responsibility bears heavy on prevention. Um, so we don't have what it takes. Um, you know, there's so many barriers as it relates to taking personal responsibility. Um, how then can we effectively um, practice public health? Um, the, 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 I mean, there, there is a mural there. How, how do we deal with it? Dr. Aiken, can you help here? <laughs> so, one of the things that, you know, I listen carefully to Dr. Frame, and, you know, she's a, obviously a public health expert. I am I am a surgeon. Oh, yes, indeed. One, one of the things that I know is that when you give people information, it does not necessarily change behavior. For example, there are many doctors who, who smoke. They know about the ill effects of smoking. They know that smoking can kill them. And in many cases, it has killed them. It has killed them, but they continue to smoke. So in Jamaica in particular, I think we, we have 
been failing in getting the message across in, in, in terms of how we deliver the message. One of the things I've always said, and I've written articles on this, is that we need a champion. We need role models. We need somebody, perhaps like a Usain Bolt, or perhaps somebody of that ill that people look up to, respect, and will um, uh, model their behaviors to come and say, look, I did my PSA and I did my rectal examination. You should go and be curious. There are many intelligent men I've spoken to who, who have the head knowledge that they should do their, their blood test, their prostate-specific antigen, and their rectal exam. But <laughs> it doesn't change behavior. And so we need to emotionally connect with people. And we need to have role models that they respect who can champion behavior change. Because I have seen repeatedly where giving people information does not necessarily. It is important that as a starting place, the people must have the information, but the information alone is not enough to change behavior. It, 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 they need to have an emotional connection they need to feel and see and, 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 and you know, feel it to their core why they must change their behavior. There must be some form of identity with this whole thing. Why is it that I am like you? That's what people need. They need exam they need, we need examples. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is why it is important that we do a lot of connection with, with our community-based organizations where we can go in. And we have women, for example, in the communities who have already who are, already, who are um, survivors of, of, of cancer, who work within communities and who would be willing to share information if they were allowed the opportunity who can lead you through. You have to ensure that the, that people who live the experience can identify themselves as part of the community and I am like you. In the same way, the same way people buy the subliminal messages as if you smoke, you will look as sexy as Miss Kitty. Well, not Miss Kitty, you're Miss Kitty. You're as Jessica Rabbit in, in the cartoons, right? No, because those are the messages that they give them. They can identify with smoking and looking sexy. We have to understand how we're gonna frame the message and it must be framed within a certain cultural context. You can't just go in and use thing. We did an, we did an ad, as you did an ad for us, and it was very well done cartoon-wise. They did all these, this lovely cartoon on breast cancer. And I had to ask them that when they did the next one to let a West Indian person speak. Because you were so distracted by the acts, the North American acts, and it's very well done. This, the script is excellent, except that I needed to hear me telling me or my cousin talking like another Grenadian, another West Indian, telling me about how you do this, and using the colloquialisms and the stuff that make me identify with. I don't think that is, uh, that we don't, that is in America, that is all there. So you have to have that cultural connection in order to get stuff. Okay, so we're gonna take our final commercial break, and when we come back, I have one more question for Dr. Frame. Dr. Frame, you notice I'm picking on you tonight, yeah? <laughs> and, I have, and I have a question for Dr. I have a question for Dr. Aiken. Yes. The truth is, we've been speaking about women's cancers, and we we cannot generalize it, but this is about women's cancers. I'm fighting for the girls here, okay? Okay. Um, so, but Doc, let's take <laughs> let's take the break. Let's take our final break, and we come back and and deal with that. And um, after that, we'll open my telephone lines because the telephone is already going. So stay with us folks, we'll be back in just a moment. Get ready for a season of Grooving Smooth and Live on GBN. Grooving Smooth and Live is a one hour performance gig every Thursday from 8pm featuring performances from our local musicians and short interviews discussing all things musical. Every Thursday, a different musician and a different instrument will be featured. From the violin to the saxophone, to the trumpet, guitar, and steel pan, our local musicians playing, improvising, and educating us on all genres of music. Join GBN with host musicians Matthias and Shireen, and a special guest every Thursday at 8 p.m. It's Grooving Smooth and Live on GBN. Here is a little known fact. There is only one place in Grenada that you can get an MRI scan done. 
That place is Spicile Imaging Center. Yes, Grenada, that's the truth. Other centers could offer you other scans, but Spy Cell Imaging provides an authentic MRI scan. Here's another little known fact. Spy Cell Imaging has three centers. We operate at Grenville, the Carnage, and at the Ocean House Grand Dance. We provide the widest range of laboratory tests and services. CT scans, x-rays, mammograms, ultrasounds, and a host of other services. We are fully staffed by a team of family doctors and specialists. Call us today at 444-7679 or 406-1500 or visit any of our three locations. Spice and Imaging, from seeing the doctor to getting lab tests, scans, and pharmacy services. We are here to take care of you. on we all need the comfort support and guidance of a trusted friend you can rely on LaCour Brothers Funeral Home we provide a personalized professional service that exceeds all expectations our dedicated staff responds to your every need with the greatest detail ensuring affordability with a variety of options upgraded state-of-the-art facilities spacious air-conditioned chapel with live internet streaming a modern environmentally safe crematorium the only of its kind on island, private viewing spaces, large on-site repair center, and modern transportation fleet. Join our burial society today and make personalized arrangements for that final moment. As you prepare to enter your loved one into eternal rest, visit or call the Quar Brothers Funeral Home and select a package that brings added comfort to the entire family. The Quar Brothers Funeral Home and Burial Society, continuing a tradition of excellence. Welcome back everyone, Dr. and Carl. Um, Dr. Nixon, did you want to ask a question? Um, because I have one more question for Dr. Frame and then we can open the line thereafter and invite our callers. Well, if your if question segues in from what she had before, what, you, what you've been talking, you can go ahead. I will ask Dr. Aiken after. Okay, so um, Dr. Frame, we, we know that cancer um, can affect um, patients and, and other people differently, in, in different ways. But um, it can have, um, you know, serious impact on, on, on large communities, on large populations. Um, if, if that is, is, is given serious attention, in other words, um, if research is done and how it affects um, large populations, what, what can we get out of that in terms of um, helping to deal with it? Another excellent question, Godfrey. 
Um, I think I'm going to go to med so, school, you know. <laughs> well, well, not med school, but you know. Public health? I think you, you should do public health. Public health. Yes, public sure. health. I agree with you. I'll do. I'll do. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, the, the benefit of doing research is that you have a basis for making decisions. Right? Um, a lot of times we find ourselves doing research for the sake of doing research. We have the information, we do nothing with it, um, you know, because there's a, a large grant and it's good for our academic future and, and so on, and, and, and we do it. Mm -hmm. Not so many large grants in Grenada, but um, you know. Um, but we get really very valuable information from doing research, right? Sometimes we, we, we make decisions um, by what we think and what we hear people say um, and what we think we see. But without, without a, 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 the framework of what research, research provides, which is a very um, structured methodological process, scientific process, that, that rigor of science, right? Um, we don't know for sure, right, if what we're doing is the right thing. We don't know if we're addressing the right problem. Right? So first of all, we have, to make, we have to make sure that we're asking the right questions when we're doing our research. To get the right, the, the, not the right answers, but the, to get the answers, um, to answer the questions that need to be answered, to solve the problems that need to be solved. Sometimes we don't like what we find, but, but that's, just, that's just the way it is. And somebody else may just have to do it again and tell us, well, you know, we found something pretty similar to what you find. So we think you're on the right track, and this is this is really the way. Um, this is the issue. And then let's not, let's not let's just say how to solve the problem, but now let's go back and ask the same people that helped us to understand the problem. Well, how do you think we can fix that? What do you think might work? Because they have the answers. And so we get not only an understanding of the problem from that population, but they also give us an understanding of the solutions, mm -hmm. right? And we make our recommendations based on that. We go back to them again and we say, well, how can you help us to actually do this thing, get this thing done? And they say to us, well, you know, but maybe if we form a little community, a little, a little organization, or you know this lady up the street up there, she's somebody that people listen to, right? Dr. Aiken's champion. Let's get her on board, and if she, if she is talking to people about this thing, they're going to listen, right? So let's use this approach, because we think in this particular community, this is going to work. You go to a different community and you ask them the same question, and they'll give you a different approach for what will work in their community, right? So, so research is important for evidence-based decision-making, but it doesn't stop there, because we also need to monitor and evaluate our programs, and this is one of our weaknesses. Right? We do a lot of programs, right? So, so Godfrey, for, Godfrey, for example, you're, you have these, these radio TV programs that you do every week, right? We think, you know, with the viewership and all of these things, we think you're doing well, you're reaching the people, maybe people are making some decisions, healthy decisions, some changes because of it. But are we really looking at the data to find out have you ever gone to ask your, your viewers and your listeners, you know, has your program, if, if your program has influenced their health decisions in any way, right? Do you know what, if what you're doing here is just wasting me and Dr. Nixon's and Dr. Aiken's time, Godfrey, right? When I could be in my bed sleeping. Or is this really helpful, right? And people are taking it on board. So that's why the monitoring and evaluation is important. We can't just implement things because it makes us feel good and so on. We have to do it because we need the data to know that what we're doing is working and we're not spinning top in mud, right? 
So, so the research is really, really critical, and not for research for the sake of, uh, of it's for its own sake, but research that serves the need of the people that can that can give us the change that we need to, to see in our communities and our country. Okay, right, um, Dr. Nixon. So we spoke about um, cancers and a lot of it, again, using that model from the person to the to, that goes up to the entire community. And in speaking about women's cancers, we don't think it's a problem of women alone. Women cancer, women business, no. Dr. Aiken, as a urologist, I know you also take care of women who has challenges um, in, the, in the reproductive organs. Um, what is the role though? How do you think our males can enhance and about, well, can close that care? How, how can they participate in the whole process of closing the care gap, closing the gaps that exist in women's cancer? From your experience or from what you have seen in your research, where do the men come in? Because we don't want to leave them out as part of the whole um, ecological um, components of of, of parts in the participation in the participating groups. Oh, that's an that's an excellent question, Sonia. Um, the truth is, as a urologist, many times I see women bringing men to me, kicking and screaming. The men are kicking and screaming. And the women, the, the, the wives, the girlfriends, sometimes the mothers, bring the men. They insist that the men come in and get their prostate checked, sometimes on threatening to lock shop and so on. Um, and so I see a lot of that. The truth is, I don't see a lot of the reverse. Um, I treat a lot more men than I, uh, than I treat women. Uh, I mean, the truth is women get kidney cancer, they get bladder cancer and so on. But prostate cancer is so highly prevalent in Jamaica that, you know, you see a, a much larger proportion of, of men. And they, men typically uh, have pretty good support uh, from their wives and, and partners. In the situation where women come, often it's a, it's a lady friend, it's a female friend, or, or a sister, or a mother who accompanies the, the, the woman to the doctor. And a lot of times the men are missing in action. That's, that's my experience. So I don't think that there is reciprocity in terms of the level of support given to our, our women that, that women give to men. And it may be a cultural problem. You know, in Jamaica, the, the, a lot of women are single mothers. They don't have the support of men. A lot of men are absentee fathers. Um, and a lot of households are run and headed by women. And so when women um, face health challenges, they, really they, they go to their network, which are invariably Girls, are yeah. their, their, their sisters or other, other, other women. And, and so the question you ask is really an important one and, and one deserving of study because to be truthful, I don't see a lot of male support. Um, it is true that there are exceptions. There are, there are committed husbands who will come with their wives and are there with them throughout the entire process. But that is more the exception than the rule in my experience. So I think there is a deficit there, uh, for sure, you know, speaking from my experience, treating um, cancers in any way. Well, thanks, because we know also that um, women, often men, are the ones who tend to detect breast lumps in their partners. We know that sometimes they're the ones who have to foot some of the bills, since the women might be less income earners. We know that we have physicians who are caregivers in a lot of gynecologists and obstetricians, are males, 
we know that women also have sons that they care. So it's important, I think, it's something we need to sensitize our men to understand, right? Culturally, yes, gender roles, as Dr. Frame indicated, um, that we our culturally ingrained gender roles tend not to allow the men, but I think it's something that we're going to have to include them. So when we're educating about breast cancer, we should include men. When we're talking about cervical cancer, we should include men. Since cervical cancer uh, basically come from women having been infected with, um, with, with the HP virus, and that comes out of sexual contact. So those are the things we have to do. When we, and I think we can only do that when we have a comprehensive way at looking at what cancers are and how they affect our communities. Every community is going to voice it according to their own language. So people in Chantimel will probably dance um, Chardonnay, right? Warble dance vacay. You would have to come to Grenada for Carnival to learn that. But the point is, different people are going to express um, in different communities differently. And unless we come together to have a, a plan and put a plan, Antonio um, spoke about having a strong health system where you have the, the resources being culturally appropriate to deal with the challenges that we have in our health system. So until we're able to include all the components, we're, going to, we're not going to get ahead. We're going to have to look at it globally, but it's going to have to come from the grassroots, and we're going to have to understand who we are so that everyone becomes a participant in this whole cancer problem and the, the, the need to close again. Okay. Dr. Frame, you, any, any comments on, 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 on this, the whole issue of um, support for cancer patients, well, women in this case? shared um you know because women have this this role that they play in our society that they've been it's been thrust upon us um some believe it's by god others believe it's by society right um but we we we're caregivers right we're the nurturers that's how we were seen and so it's so much easier because of the way that we're raised and all of that to, to be there to support those who need the support, whether it's a man or it's another woman, right? It's easier for us to do that. Um, and, I, and I think as well that men provide support in different ways. But, um, and oftentimes people provide support in the way that they are comfortable and not the way that the person who needs the support actually needed to be demonstrated. So I think that that's important, um, that the woman might need the man to actually show up and be there at the doctor with, with, with her, right? Um, and that's important. And as Dr. Aiken said, that doesn't happen a lot, right? Um, you know, it's not good enough that because maybe of her, of her situation, her economic situation, that she has to rely on him to pay for, for her medical care, right? Because it's not available. Otherwise, we don't have national health insurance or a national health fund or, or something like that. that it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but we, we do need our men to show up for our women in very tangible ways, um, you know, as, as, as supporters, as cheerleaders, um, letting them know emotionally, being there for them emotionally and, and in all of those other ways um, that, you know, they're, they're there for them and you have to say it. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes you need the words to express it, and I know men are very action-oriented. Um, so, so use some of that action to show, actually show us in those ways that support to get through those those difficult times. Okay, wonderful. So um, we're going to open our telephone line. Um, it has been going well. Um, and, and folks, you can ask your questions. So let's go to a telephone at this time and see who is with us. Dr. Nicole, good evening. Great. It is an Augustine. Thanks for the opportunity. I must indeed say that I cherish this level of conversation. By the way, can your guests hear me all? Yes, they are. Very well. I do cherish this level of conversation, communication with the people in relation to health. But I want to ask a particular question. It has to do with public health 
and in effect the mitigation of disease, the creation of disease and the suffering that people go through. And little reading tells me, and you're speaking particularly of cancer this, this evening, but there are other things, many others. Lil Reading tells me that air pollution, I refer to the breathing in and out of contaminated air, weather from emission, from vehicle exhaust, the burning of chemical composites, plastic, foam, composites, wood composites and other things. Agricultural stubble tires. Huh? Agricultural stubble, construction rubble. Charcoal kilns, or locally known as coal pits in the middle of villages. That these thing, things discharge chemicals that are not good for the human body and create problems with organ failure, strokes, um, cardiovascular conditions, and otherwise. Doctors, I dare challenge, oh pardon, I retract that. I urge you to spend a minute, each one of you, to speak to the people of this here country, especially the leadership, that they should seriously begin to look into and commence a debate, a serious conversation on burning of these levels of materials in public because they're affecting the health of the people. Personally, from what I've read, I think we're killing ourselves alive. But people take it as nothing. Oh, yo, we go, old grandparents live in smoke, burning wood. No, it's not the same today. I urge you, gentlemen, can you show us the connection between air pollution and these diseases that we're talking about, particularly cancers? And whatever advice you can give to the people, especially the state of Grenada, to put measures or at least begin to put measures to combat this thing that our people can respire well in this air country, their right to clean air, and which will help help us to exist a little longer in this air country. I trust that my question is clearly understood, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kola. Thank you, indeed. Um, uh, uh, let's let's start with Dr. Frame, um, because we, we're dealing with, um, you know, uh, Grenada here, and we'll go to Dr. Aiken right after. Thank you very much, Kola. Um, such an incredibly important question, right? Our behaviors, our very own behaviors, right, are putting us at risk for these negative um, consequences that you're talking about. Yeah. So, I, and I know that that's part of what Godfrey was talking about when he when he when he talked about the personal responsibility, right? Um, but yes, all of these things are linked. Um, the link with air pollution and um, you know uh, our our level of exposure to the sun, and because we feel you know we're dark skin and we live in the tropics, we don't have to wear um, we don't have to wear sunscreen to go outside. We don't need to wear a hat to protect ourselves, right? Um, the as you mentioned, the the, the, the emissions from the vehicles. Right? When we, we have the opportunity to inspect our vehicles annually, are we using that opportunity to really look at some things that can affect the environment? Right? Um, yes, we're checking, the, we're, we're doing the safety checks on the vehicle, but it's an opportunity to also look at what's coming out of our vehicles, that old black, dirty smoke that hits you in the face when you're driving, right? What is that? What is that doing to us, right? Um, where our communities, our people live, near, um, near the dump site in Perseverance, Right? What are they, and, and when you live there for so long, you don't smell it anymore, but what are they inhaling? What are they breathing in? Right? Um, when, when we have communities around, um, you know, our electricity plants and those kinds of things, right? 
um, how is that affecting affecting our health, right? And do we have the data locally? Are we looking at the information that we're collecting? Because we have, it's a lot of information that we have, but are we looking at that information to guide us as to these are the communities um, that are, you know, the, maybe the, the geographical areas that are more um, affected, that are coming down maybe with more cases of cancers, right? And do we need to pay some special attention to those particular communities because they're at a higher risk? And the, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, cancers fall under a broader heading of non, chronic non-communicable diseases. Right? So we're, we're speaking about it as a separate disease. But the risk factor for cancer is actually shared with a host of other chronic non-communicable diseases. So in fact, if we take these measures, all of the measures that the, 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 the problem areas that the caller identified, if we take the measures to address those um, those those concerns in society, all very important ones, right? We're not just making a dent with our incidence of cancer or new cases of cancer in our community, right? We're making a dent on uh, on, on heart diseases, right? We're making a dent on just just name them. You're 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 making a, a, a positive impact on 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 those um those those conditions, right? So um, I don't want to put words in the caller's mouth. I think the caller did an excellent job framing the issue, and I think um, the, the 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 folks in authority, um, you know, the, the the caller can really the caller has spoken for himself essentially. I don't really need to add a whole lot, but I've added some, right? I think the caller was right on point. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Aiken, you, you, you heard the caller and, and the concerns? Sure, I, I think the caller, as Dr. Frame said, is right on point. There is overwhelming um, evidence, public health evidence, that atmospheric pollution increases the risk not only of cancer but of other chronic diseases. And I think uh, there doesn't need to be any debate on the matter. I think legislation needs to be enacted um, where there are penalties for people burning, um, you know, some of the communities. That, that should be banned, um, quite frankly. Um, you know, in, in Jamaica, there is legislation, but the problem is enforcement. You have to not only have the legislation, but you have to have the ability to enforce it as well. So, and it's not just about um, burning as well. There are a lot of old buildings have asbestos that is going to cause um, Cancer. Cancers. Um, some buildings are predisposed to mold on the walls and so on, which is can lead to respiratory diseases and so on. So um, the whole the whole issue of atmospheric pollution is a very important one. I really thank the caller for bringing that issue. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go back to the telephone, Doctor and Call. Good evening. Hello. Got very good night. Yes, good evening, caller. It's another boss program. Congratulations. I, but I want I wanted to hear Dr. Freeman's response to the question you asked earlier with respect to personal responsibility because I'm a fond believer in that. And I remember Dr. Nixon when she was at the Ministry of Health, she had issue with the fact that the slogan drink responsibly, yeah. Um, it doesn't really make much sense. And I I understood her, her reasoning at that time. And uh, it still resonates with me. But to Dr. Freeman, I would really like her to answer that question seriously. Because for weeks, Godfrey, and perhaps months, yourself and Mr. Bizinski would have spoken at length about vaccination against COVID-19. Now, the question is, eh, government stakeholders, everyone, including Dr. Nixon and he, yourself, also presented the facts and the benefits of vaccination. I'm speaking about in this this current COVID pandemic. And our numbers are still low. Yeah? Now, 
should government mandate? Because then, if it is not your personal responsibility, whose responsibility it is? Because there is this old saying too, you could take the, sh- the donkey to the water, but you can't make a drink. So, so if in the abundance of water here, in the abundance of all the information, of all the access, of all the, the vaccines and so on, the campaigns that were held, the messaging, the, 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 the pop-up share and there, and the, the numbers are still low, whose responsibility? Because I don't think that it should be anyone else's responsibility but your responsibility. I agree that they're supposed to be supporting mechanisms. <laughs> But I, I fundamentally believe that if you do not make the first step, when Dr. Nixon walked at diminish yourself, yeah, you know, we had, uh, 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 it was for Caribbean Wellness Day, you know? And how many people came up? Now, look, I was looking at the statistics from the viewership right now on, on, on Facebook. Less than 30 people, you, put, you, you, you present such a well-packaged program here tonight, and the interest is elsewhere. I can't speak for television, but I'm just looking at it, and I'm saying to you, had it been something more sexy or sensational, I am sure that there would have been more people. So whose responsibility it is? And I want Dr. Frame to honestly tell me that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. Uh, Dr. Frame? Um, I don't have all the answers. That I will tell you. I don't have all the answers. Um, but what I can say is that it, there, it, it has to be a partnership between the government and the people, right? And so from my estimation, there's a breakdown in that partnership. There's a breakdown in the communication. There's a breakdown somewhere along the line um, that prevents that partnership, that collaboration, that trust from people taking the advice that they have received, right, to get vaccinated. And that goes for any other health problem, not just for vaccinations. If you're giving someone advice Right, and they're not taking the advice, then you have to find out where is the disconnect, right? And like I said, the answer doesn't come from me, but the answer comes from the people. They're the ones with the answers, not me, right? Um, and so, the, as as Dr. Aiken said, you know, the information is only the first step. So, if you're giving the information. Is the information reaching the people? Are all of the modalities of the information that you're providing, is that information reaching the people? Is it reaching the people that it reached before? So they're they're saturated with the information, right? And that information is not getting through to anybody new. Then it means that you may need to change something about the information, whether it's it's the, the, the messenger, maybe it's the message, Maybe it's how the message, where the message is being is being delivered, right? Um, but that information comes from the people. And, and I firmly believe in when the people speak, that we must listen. Or else we're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again and not getting any different results, right? Um, So, I mean, these are very, very difficult times. It really is for all of us. I have small children and they, you know, they're not in school. I keep them home. I would love for them to go out and play. They love people, right? Um, but, But this is where we are. And yes, we each have to do our part. But for some reason, the message is just not reaching people about what they need to do to do their parts, right? People have not accepted the message about what they need to do to do their part. And I don't know that mandatory vaccination will solve the problem because my concern about mandatory vaccination, um, one of the concerns I have about it is that when you back people against the wall, bad things happen, right? And you're forcing, you're gonna force people to make compromising decisions 
that is going to put us in a worse position, right? Economically, socially, right? Emotionally. And developmentally. Developmentally, right? And it's only going to put us in a worse position. I think the short-term view is that, yes, we may get the numbers, but the long-term perspective, I don't think it's, it's going to be good. That's my, that, that's my opinion, uh, my, my public health opinion. No, no. So my, before we go on, my public health opinion on that further. You know, they say when your neighbor bed catch a fire, wet yours. And as we, as, we, as we sit here talking about cancer and closing the gap to care, we have to learn from the mistakes of this past campaign and ensure that we don't repeat wherever the shortcomings. We have to understand where did we not succeed. I'm not going to say fail, because I don't think we failed outright, but where did we not succeed? And how are we going to include and use that socio-ecological model appropriately to ensure that programs that we develop, whether it's a simple campaign about doing your pap smell, there's a simple campaign about making your girls get HPV vaccine, but there's a simple campaign about um, learning to do self-breast examination that we go to the poor, to the people who want it and work collectively with them because they know more than anything what they don't want. You can tell them what's good for them, then they will say, okay, let's see how we can fix this. How can we work together? We have to also ensure that in doing our cancer um, prevention and, and care campaign, um, or, or whole plan and, and implementing any plan that we have, that we ensure that it comes from the core, that it comes from the people, that we work collectively, go to the grassroots and don't make the mistakes and fail. Because we cannot fail because they've already predicted that in the next two years we're going to have that mushroom enough cancer, especially because of the deficit in um, education, the deficit in screening, the deficit in early care that we've had as a result of COVID being made number one and forgetting everything else. Okay. Dr. Aiken, any, any comments? Um, I, I, you know, I listened carefully to Dr. Frame, and I think the, the answer that she gave was perfect. Um, the only thing I would add is that you, you, you have to know the culture of the people, and your messaging has to be culturally appropriate, and you have to engage with the people sufficiently before um, rolling out any program. In Jamaica, the HPV vaccination of, of teenagers um, teenage girls failed miserably and simply because there was not enough stakeholder engagement with the parents, with the schools, with the churches. There was a lot of um, backlash from the churches in particular and, and that simply happened because there was not enough appropriate, culturally appropriate engagement and communication. I am not for mandating vaccination either. I think if, I, if you know the culture of our people, that would be a disaster, you know, both socially and politically. And so, politically in particular. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's go back to our telephone. Dr. Nkor, good evening. Well, good evening. Good evening to all. Dr. Nixon, good evening. Everybody else. Hi. I just want to ask, eh, in the last um, maybe about um, four, five years, I have to say four or five because time is going really fast with COVID, right? We have been losing our doctors and other medical people, and it's almost five doctors and, you know, some other medical personnel. We have lost them to cancer. Was any any um, investigation done, and will we see any changes? Will the um, circumstances be made differently for doctors to operate at the general hospital? hospital. I thank you. Thank you very much, Kuala. Um, uh, do Dr. Nixon, I'll, 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 I'll put you on the spot with that one. Yeah, that's, that's really putting me on the spot. But it's like, um, and, and I understand this, this, this person's concern, because I think we had a little conversation. I don't remember who it is, but we had a little, there, was a little there, there were questions. And, and I think it's important because doctors, remember that doctors are ordinary people too, okay? But when it comes to population, we have a very finite population. And when you have as many cancer, we lost three doctors in a year. Three? Um, Barry, Tomo, and 
somebody else, and then Dr. Lambert a dozen years or so ago. We've lost some of our very prolific and very well-known doctors. It comes back to the fact that we are a community that is severely affected by cancer. You will see the doctors because they will stand out more, right? And maybe, yes, we need to see, does a hospital have asbestos? Does a, what it is about our hospital? Is it stress? Is it whatever? I don't know. Our doctor screening, as Dr. Aiken said, um, we're probably the worst. Um, are we taking care of ourselves? Eh? But we would stand out if we become affected by cancer, and most of you die. It means that that is a population that you're going to have to work with specifically and remind doctors that, yeah, you can do all the pap smears you want for other people. Remember to make your wife get her pap smear or you get your pap smear as well. You can do all the separate, all the examinations. You can write up as many um, things for a mammogram. You can send and do as many colonoscopies as you want, but please include yourself. So I think it goes back to finding that finite population that stands up, because the doctors will stand out. We lost three doctors in that one year, I remember that. 2018, 19, when we lost three very prolific physicians, including people who worked in cancer. So we are three very important. You know, you know, and, and people. Yes, Barry. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We, we, did a, we did a study at the university some years ago. We did a, a cross-sectional survey where we interviewed um, consultants, consultant physicians at the University of West Indies, University Hospital. And we asked these men about their knowledge and attitudes and practices. Practices. Um, towards prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening. And what we found was that they were very, very knowledgeable about prostate cancer. They were very aware about it. They knew all the screening tests and the age of start screening, etc. But very few of them had actually screened. Very few of them had actually done the PSA test or the digital rectal examination. Which brings me back to the point I made earlier, that um, a knowledge or awareness, cognitive awareness or head knowledge of, of, of risk and, and a disease does not necessarily change behavior. You know, and it, we saw it very, it was very stark in these doctors who were well informed. They knew what to do, but they didn't actually do it. And in some cases, uh, you know, we have had quite a few doctors who have died from prostate cancer, mm -hmm. or who have been diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer. And uh, um, you think that doctors should know better, but in fact, they do know better what the, pra the actual practice, practice. is not there. Of the behaviors, yeah. Let me, let me just ask this, um, Dr. Aiken, uh, or Dr. Frey, many of you can take it. Um, you know, sometimes we we know what to do, um, but as Dr. Nixon said um, when when the the caller mentioned about you know we losing a couple of doctors, um, could it be that there is this fear inside of us as it relates to what we might hear? Doctors are people I, 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 I don't know what to think. Yeah, doctors are people too. <laughs> so um, they do get frightened. Um, you know, could it be that? Um, and, and if that is the case, how do we overcome that? How do we get people to understand, look, um, yes, we know you're frightened, but um, this is something that you need to do. So, so I'll, I'll go first. So in, in, and I'll use prostate cancer as an example. So in the case of prostate cancer, there are a number of barriers um, to, to screening. And the fear of the diagnosis and the fear of the consequences of treatment or the potential consequences of treatment, especially those consequences that affect a man's sexual functioning, are a major barrier. In Jamaica in particular, there is also the barrier of the, one of the tests, the digital rectal examination. Um, that men really frown up on and there it's considered taboo. So, so fear is a factor and this has been studied. Um, there is also denial. Um, you know, this cannot happen to me. And there's also 
you know, the, 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 the feeling that, you know, uh, this, this, this people, men die with prostate cancer and not from it, you know, so it's unlikely that I will die from prostate cancer. But the fact is, it's a leading cause of death, cancer-related death in men in the Caribbean, not just Jamaica, but in the entire Caribbean. And so men are definitely dying from it. And so these are important barriers. And again, it's education, 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 trying to reach men. Um, and what sometimes works is when they have a friend who, who has been diagnosed with cancer, instead them coming in to be actually screened, when they know somebody that has been directly affected, who, they, who seems just as healthy and well as they, they seem, and they realize, hey, this thing can really affect somebody who looks good and healthy and strong. That's when they may come in and get it done. Uh, Dr. Frame, are you any comments? I agree. I agree with Dr. Aiken. Um, but I also want to add um, maybe less so for doctors and or maybe not. Um, just the fear of the of the, the exam, the fear of the test might be the first level of it. Yeah, because it's invasive. Um, you know, we have these this very type of masculine culture where you know, men are very sensitive about that that part of their anatomy, right? So I think even getting men comfortable enough um, to just be accepting of having the exam done, I think that's a fear that we have to um, we have to address. Um, but but I, I agree with everything else Dr. Egan said. Okay, wonderful. But also, also remind you that it also means women, and and I think it it has to do with the challenge that um, physicians tend not to practice a lot of self health self care. They tend not to. Um, we're always the last to do our whatever test there is, and and uh, because I want to focus on what the what the what the, what the caller asked, we tend not to focus on self care as much as we focus on caring for other for people. other people. So. Okay. That's one of the things that we're going to have to address as a group. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we take one one final call, um, 435-2041, and uh, um, one, one final question as we get ready to wrap for this evening. The number again, 435-2041. Line was, let's take that final call. Doctor and call, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yes, sir. To the panel, yes. My question is to the doctors. Why it is in India, Africa, they don't have that problem as the Western world? That is my question. Because in India, which these people they have it as they much live in a much more comfortable position than us. Africa just the same way as they say. But in the West Indies and North America, this is a big issue. What is the difference? Thank you. Don't, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. What exactly are you asking? What difference in what? We're talking about prostate problem. Okay. In men. If okay. you look at India, the water ratio, look at Africa and prostate. Them don't have a big problem with that, as we also in the West Indies. Okay, thank you, thank you, caller. We got it. Yes, um, Dr. Akon. So, what the caller um, just alluded to is definitely not so. Africa, sub Saharan Africa in particular, has one of the highest death rates. In fact, sub Saharan Africa and the Caribbean compete for first place in, in terms of the death rate from prostate cancer. Sometimes we are number one, they are number two. Sometimes they overtake us and they are in the number one position. So it is not true to say that in Africa, their prostate cancer is not a major problem. No, there are, there are ethnic differences in prostate cancer incidents. We know that um, Southeastern Asia generally has a low incidence rate of prostate cancer compared 
to other parts of the world. And we know that prostate cancer, one of the risk factors for prostate cancer is being of African ancestry. So just being of African descent or African ancestry increases your risk of prostate cancer significantly. The other major risk factors, of course, are age and family history. But we know, we know that when men from Southeastern Asia migrate to the United States and adopt a westernized diet, we know that within a generation, approximately 20 years, their incidence of prostate cancer approximates that of the country they have migrated to. Now these people take their genes with them, their genetic material has not changed. What has changed is their environment, and particularly their diet and lifestyle. So we know that diet and lifestyle has a lot to do with the incidence of prostate cancer, and specifically things such as the intake of red meat, the intake of animal fat, the intake of processed meats, all of these things increase your risk, not only of prostate cancer, but of other cancers as well. So it is a it is not a simple issue. We know that there are there are ethnic um, there are ethnic disparities in, in the incidence of prostate cancer, but we also know that diet and lifestyle play an important role. And so that accounts for some of the differences that we see in the incidence of prostate cancer in Southeast Asia as opposed to um, westernized countries such as North America and Africa. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiken. So that was our last call, and um, we have gotten to the point where we have to wrap for this evening. So um, in, in closing, I, I want to put to both um, Dr. Aiken and Dr. Frame, um, going forward, as it relates to closing the gap, um, uh, of course, uh, prevention and, 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 and treatment and all of that. Um, where are we at this stage? And, and we're talking here about moving forward. Um, Dr. Frame, you're going to go first? Prevention is going forward. Um... So I, I want to say that despite all of the sort of, um, you know, it, it may seem that things are like things are bleak, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things going against us, right? Um, but I generally like to say that, you know, all is not lost and all is not bad, right? Um, we have a lot of strength within our communities, within our government, right? Um, within our academic institution, within our civil society sectors, um, different aspects of our society, our youth, right? We mainly talk about, about, the, about, about adults, about women, right? Um, but a lot of these things don't start in adulthood. Right, they start much earlier. Sometimes, you know, during at at at, at conception, <laughs> right in the womb, in childhood, we start developing these problems, and they follow us throughout our life. Right, um, so we can't leave out the young people in this conversation, and there are a lot of strengths within this place called Grenada. Um, and so I know that, you know, communities right now is just a very difficult time for everybody, including for governments and for the Ministry of Health. And so we really have to each do our part, right? Um, we're looking to the, to the, all of us are looking to the Ministry for Leadership. Yeah, to the Ministry of Health for Leadership, because that's the position that they play. Um, and so when we feel that things, things are not right there, I think the, 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 the communities react, right? And, and so 
we, we need that leadership from the Ministry of Health, but we also need the people to support what the ministry is trying to do. So it's a, it's, it's a partnership. The ministry cannot do it by themselves. The people cannot do it by themselves. We have to work together, right? Um, because we don't have a lot of resources to work with. So I think going forward in this new normal, which is how we have to look at it, right? Um, you know, a lot of us are not wearing our masks anymore these days, um, but it's still a new normal. It's never going to be, at least not for a while, what we knew before, um, you know, 2020. So I think I would encourage people. There are lots, there's lots of information out there, a lot of information locally. You know, Food and Nutrition Council is doing a lot. Cancer Society is doing a lot. Ministry of Health, take the information on board. Have discussions within your households, with people at school, at your church, the people that you trust, right? And call somebody and try to figure out how you can use this information to make the changes that need to be made. If you need to call the ministry about it, call the ministry about it, right? But we can't just be consumers of information and we do nothing with it. We have to act use the information that we're getting, process it, and turn that information into some kind of action, right? And, and the ministry is relying on us to do that, right? But we're also relying on the ministry to be there to provide the things that we need. So it's a, so it's a real partnership, and it's not easy, but I think there are willing participants out there and, and, and all the participants have to feel that the table is open to them, that they're not excluded from the table, that they're part of the table, that they're not only part of the problem, but they're part of the solution. And I really think that is how we have to go forward, seeing each other as partners, and that together internally, as Grenadians, government and people, we can solve our problems if we work together, not relying heavily on outsiders, right? Whomever they may be to make those decisions and to help us to fix these problems because internally we have the capacity. We don't have the money, but we have the capacity. We can do it and everything is not about money. Um, so we can do it because we have what it takes to get it done. Let's just do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Freed. Um, Dr. Aiken, um, the, 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 the Caribbean is, is very close-knitted. Um, a lot of things you see happen in Grenada, um, you would see it happen in, 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 in Jamaica. Um, you know, Grenada, we, we have Kirani James. Jamaica followed us, and they, they tried to come with Usain Bolt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you, 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 see the, you see this kind of thing happening so we're very close and so going forward um yes we have our our job here in Grenada cut out for us but um you know the, the Caribbean also has a part to play as an entity in moving forward um your 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 comments your closing comments there oh Godfrey you read my mind because as I listened to Dr. Frame speak that's exactly what I was thinking about our our commonalities mm -hmm. I think tonight we have focused on different spheres that affect health. We have looked at the individual, we have looked at family, we have looked at communities, we have looked at the government, but there is CARICOM as well. Um, CARICOM has agreements with PAHO um, to reduce the level of non-communicable diseases, and I'm sure Grenada is part of that. And so, as Dr. Frame said, it, it is an interdependent system with everybody working together, the individual, the family, the communities, the government. Government has a role to play, as we've said, in terms of, of um, creating the environment that makes it 
easy to make the right choices um, to, to maintain our health. So things like taxation and things that are bad for us, cigarettes, alcohol, etc., etc. Creating, you know, um, recreational facilities so that people can find it easy to go and exercise and lose weight and so on. All of these things are important. And then at the individual level, taking responsibility um, for your health. And as we said, it's not just the individual, but it's in partnership with the government, with the, with the community. So it's, it's very important to look at the interdependence of, of everyone working together to create a healthy environment. And, and, and so I think tonight we have hit the nail on the head in terms of not just focusing on the individual, but also looking at the bigger picture mm -hmm. in terms of how it impacts our health. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiken. Um, Dr. Nixon, your, your final words, and then we, we wrap for tonight. See, the fat lady sings, so we wrap. Seriously, though. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you guys very much for leading this, especially Dr. Aiken for bringing the whole Caribbean perspective. Thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Frey for the global perspective on, on our challenges. You know, everyone who listens tonight, we're asking them to, to, be, to be empowered. To my favorite instrument, everybody knows, going there and go on to what the World Health Organization says about conditions. Go to the National Institutes of Health, go to um, National Cancer Institute, go to where the information is true. Let us not be distracted by the people who showed foolishness over there. Let's get real information and empower. I think tonight's conversation um, really shows us that there are a lot more questions to be asked. A lot more answers. But you know, the Jamaicans have a saying that you can't stay so far to throw salt in a pot, right? And there's a big pot in which all of us have to participate. So come here, people. Let's get together. Let's join in communities. Let's let's start the conversations in the communities. Start sharing information. Guys, when you go on the field and there's a cricket game or a football game, talk about he's 25 years old. Has he thought of how well is he eating? Is he exercising? Is he encouraged to kill? And can you go back to this community and get the other young children to play cricket and football and participate? Um, women, you know, uh, are we going to talk to our families about get our girls getting their vaccinations against HPV? Are we encouraging our women to get their breast exams? Guys, have you done your prostate test? I've had mine, you know, tell her. Yes, we have had mine, and it's not that bad. Most of them, I did probably like 50 or 60 men last year, and they all felt like converts. Oh, that's all it is. Oh, good. So let's encourage each other to, to get to be aware of, of what 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 our bodies can do for us and how we can pr protect our bodies and make it the, the most precious thing we have. All of us pray to death because we don't want to lose our body. That's the, the bottom line. So um, let's empower ourselves with knowledge and let's share the knowledge and let's make it easy instead of talking foolishness when you go out there about what dress, which girl nice and which girl not nice. Let's talk about serious things, about how I'm going to live to 90, how I'm going to live to 80, how, how much tomatoes have I planted, that you can actually plant a whole family garden in the size, that you, in, in the size of a, car, a, a, a single car park, where you park your car, the size of your car. The bigger your car, the more food you can plant on the ground. So put a car outside in the rain and, and take down the garage and plant food. But the things we can do, what am I, what can I do within this bigger picture? Seek information. Um, maybe the information doesn't reach you the way you want it. Get people, go to your doctor, trust me, ask. You can get individual information, it's all there, okay? Hopefully when you learn more, when individuals in our community learn more, they make bigger demands on those who make policy decisions. Because that's where we're going to have to go. We're going to go to elections soon. But you have to make sure that the person who gets elected is in the ha wants that your health be the best it can be. That you can speak to your, your representative in your, in your electoral district and say, hey, are we going to be able to be screened? Can we get blood tests? Um, are we going to have place so we can plant ground? Are you going to give little plots of land so we can plant the fact that they can, they can plant food? Is there any place to exercise? What happened to the health center that you closed on last week? It's going to be reopened. Are you going to make sure that we have culturally appropriate people who know how we think up in Chantimel or in Lamont, um, 
about our health, what are our needs, okay? So that you, you uh, where's the funding? Are we going to ensure that health funding is improved? Um, who's going to provide for a woman who needs a radiotherapy to go to Antigua to get her care? Are we going to be bringing physicians part-time? How are we going to collaborate with St. George's University to ensure that as our, our prime health education and center that we can get better involvement in preventing care? Are we going to train more doctors to become primary care physicians so that they can work at a primary care level? How are we going to support our nurses? How are we going to ensure that facilities are there so that people in primary care? That is what we're going to do. That is the politics of it. Okay, that's how we're going to become responsible and take and take on um, take on whatever we decide that as a as a as a group of people. Start with an individual uh, on an individual that we will ensure that care is handed. At the end of the day, it is, it is yes our responsibility to work within a bigger group to ensure that we can collectively close that care gap, especially as it relates to cancer, which we're talking about tonight, right? It's been a long road, and we know there are lots more things that we have to do. So I'm going to ask you to just become aware and figure out how am I going to make a change? How am I going to encourage change in my home, in my community? How am I going to prevent obesity in my children so that they don't have cancer, they don't be part of the 65% by 2030? All of those things. What is my responsibility? Can I meet it? And how am I going to get support to make sure that my responsibilities um, are achieved? I can use my respons my sense of the responsibility to achieve the quality of health and the well-being that I deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nixon. I, I just want to close by saying, um, actually, mm. something I read, you know, um, and it says that, um, you know, someone's, someone's, Ill health or, or ill health can seriously affect um, an individual's economic prospects. But health is generally valued when sickness comes. Prior to that, um, we, we, we carefree. We don't get screened, we don't go do our checkups, um, you know, and all of that. And so um, I really hope that our listeners tonight, you know, paid very close attention to the information that was disseminated and that we don't just, as our grand press used to say, let it pass in one air and go out in the other. But we take it really serious. And, and, and let's take our health in our hands. Um, we know that there are barriers, um, as, as Dr. Frame, you know, excellent explained to us there are barriers it's the fact but um, we still have a part to play we just can't sit down and say you know what well you know um, this is unavailable so I can't do anything there must be something you can do you know to at least help to mitigate you may not be able to solve the problem but you might be able to mitigate and make your life a little easier so let's do what we can and let us ensure that we play our part in this partnership so that we all can have the best possible health. Dr. Aiken, I thank you very much for appearing again. And, of course, um, we definitely will be calling you again sometime. Uh, Dr. Frame, it was such a pleasure. And um, I know we have an engagement soon coming, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Nixon? No, I want to remind people that COVID still keeping. And oh my crap is over there trying to grab us. Um, I know there's there's Caracou Carnival coming up. I'm going to ask people, please party responsibly. Be responsible for yourself. Wear your mask. Do not drink and get drunk so you don't know where you are and whether or not your mask is still on your face. Do sanitization and as far as possible, keep away. Please, please be responsible not only for yourself, but for the people, especially our seniors and the people who have little resistance. And of course, reminding people that we are not wearing a mask tonight because we are in different places. <laughs> and the four corners of the earth, here we are. No, we have to remind them. We're not sitting in the same room and therefore we're not wearing masks. Were we so? Please remember that masks are still fashionable and worn properly covering your face. Enjoy carnival if you should go. You don't have to go watch it on TV. I hear it's nicer there. But um, please be safe. I'm, I'm begging you guys because we don't want to have to take our children back out of school. They just started face to face for the first time in several months. Um, we don't want to have to take them back out of school. We are not looking forward to a surge. And Omicron is still out there waiting for us. 
Thank and you very much. Has health is wealth. So let's try and let's be healthy so that we can be wealthy. Oh, definitely. Thank you very much, Dr. Nixon. Thanks again, Dr. Freeman, Dr. Aiken. Until next time, do have a good night. All the best. Russian banks.